Hey, my name is Jimmy Cooper, and I'm the minister of worship here at Open Door Church. We're so glad that you took time out of your day to come study God's Word with us. At Open Door Church, it's our mission to love God and make His gospel known. If you live in the Raleigh area, we invite you to come join us in person at either our 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. service. Now let's hear from God's Word. Good morning, Open Door. It is good to see you today. It is also great to see all of these Creed Camp shirts. If you're freshly back from Creed Camp and you had a great time, let me hear from you. All right. I want to say a special thanks to the adults who went and uh, chaperoned the trip, gave up uh, sleep, uh, heard lots of different conversations and questions and different all kinds of topics, but loved and invested in our kids. And as a parent of a kid who went to Creed Camp, I am so thankful for the work of those adults that have helped there. And so blessings on you and those efforts. You know, we have started a series this summer uh, called Why We Gather. And there's a variety of different topics that we're going to be discussing as to why we gather as a local church. Last week, Pastor Dwayne talked to us about the fact that we gather is because we are the body of Christ. Christ is ahead of our church. We gather together as a body of Christ. And next week, we're going to be talking about how that we gather because it is in that location that we receive the ministry of the word. This week, though we're going to be talking about the fact that we gather because we are confessing our faith through the unity that we have as the body of Christ, as this local body of Christ that we call Open Door Church. You know, there's lots of diversity in this room, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different histories, things that make some things up. There's people that have different theological positions on uh, some tertiary issues, some kind of more minor issues. You know, we all agree that the Lord's coming back, but there's differences that some of you might have as to when exactly the Lord's coming back. Is he coming back before the tribulation? Is he coming back during, after, after the millennium? There's all kinds of debate on those particular topics there, but we all agree that the Lord is coming back. Beyond even theological topics, you might have some differences on things like music. You love some of the new praise and worship music, but some of you also love the old hymns of the faith that you grew up in that kind of represent the heart language that you have and the words that are ingrained in your memory. We have differences on education. We have some people here who are convictionally committed to homeschool, some that send their kids to private school, even private Christian school, and some that send their kids to public school. One of the things that we have seen this past two years with the pandemic and the election cycle is some of the biggest challenges to unity within the local church that I think the local church has seen in a long, long time. Over issues that shouldn't separate the local church. We have differences on masks, differences on vaccines, differences on lockdowns. And all of these things have caused in many situations for there to be division within the local church. We have race relation issues, that we have differences on opinions on how it is that those things are to be dealt with. We even have people in this church, some that like NC State, some that like UNC, and some like Duke. Some that have bought into the conspiracy theory on how NC State was removed from the College World Series. We even have some people in this church that believe that cats are an acceptable household pet. But somehow, somehow, (laughs) somehow, we live in unity with one another. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, he says, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's a question that I want to pose to you today. The question is this. How do we live in unity as brothers and sisters in Christ in this local church, while being made up of members that hold to a variety of different convictions and come from a variety of different backgrounds? The answer is this. We live in unity as brothers and sisters in Christ in our local church because we hold tightly to what is most important and loosely to everything else because of our love towards one another. Today, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 8, or if you have your electronic Bible, turn it on, navigate to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And we're going to look and see how it is in this passage 
that we confess our faith in unity and how it is that we live in unity with one another. You know, the Corinthian church was an absolute mess. It still amazes me today if you drive around and you see some place called Corinth Baptist Church. Even if they're in the town of Corinth, the fact that they are called Corinth Baptist Church is amazing when you look and you see what condition this church was in. They were divided over a variety of different topics. They were variety of, uh, d- divided over what leader they follow. Some people followed Paul. Some people followed Apollos. Some people were the super spiritual ones, and they followed Jesus Christ. In addition, you had differences over things about lawsuits among believers, marriage issues, what we're going to see today, meat, sacrifice to idols, jealousy over different spiritual gifts that existed within the church, and even the truth and implications of the resurrection. This was a church that was severely divided and severely challenged with unity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, Paul says this at the beginning of this letter. He says, For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready because you're still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? He reminds him at the close of this letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 through 14, saying this, be alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. What I want us to see this morning is three major themes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. They're going to help us learn how it is that we live in unity as a body of Christ. All of the different tribes that we come from. Where this disunity comes from is we allow these worldly tribes to cause division in the church. What I want to encourage you today is to recognize that this tribe that you're a part of, Open Door Church, is your greatest identification here as you work together as a body of Christ, as, a fo- as all followers of Christ seeking to bring glory to him. Don't let your identification of a tribe as to your political party, your views on various conspiracies, your views on education, all of these kinds of things serve as division within the church because you have been called as a member of this church to be unified with this body of Christ and walk together with them. The first thing that I want us to see is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. I want us to see that we live in unity through humility by seeking to build one another up in love. We live in unity through humility by seeking to build one another up in love. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. Paul says this to the church in Corinth and likewise to us. Now about uh, food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. This letter that has been written to Corinth or to uh, the church in Corinth is a response, most scholars believe, to a series of questions that were opposed, that were posed to the Apostle Paul by the church in Corinth. We know this because if you go back to chapter 7, chapter 7 he's primarily dealing with marriage issues. And he starts chapter 7 with the statement, now in response to the matters that you wrote about. So it's a sense of these questions that are being posed back to. And that's why 1 Corinthians, in many ways, kind of, it kind of jerks around to different topics because Paul is really just answering a series of questions. It's very different than the typical kind of letter that Paul wrote to a church. And the topic that we get to in chapter 8 that was happening in Corinth is, can you eat meat sacrificed to idols? I know this is a problem that you probably have dealt with on a regular basis in your Christian walk, but this is an issue that they are facing here in Corinth, and quite honestly, is an issue that outside of our American context is still very much an issue. We don't need to think that this is something that has simply gone away. It's just in the context that we're in, it's a little bit different. And so he says, now about food sacrifice to idols, he says, we know that we all have knowledge. So what you had in the Corinthian church is a bunch of people that had felt like that they had the freedom to eat meat sacrificed to idols, and a bunch of people that felt like that, no, this was a violation of their conscience, and they could not participate in this. They were sinning if they ate 
meat sacrificed to idols. Those that were more mature, those that felt more free, felt like they had a knowledge that they had arrived at. They had, they had moved past and they had grown past where everyone else is to see how it is that they could eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now, Paul, by implication in this particular passage and in chapters 9 and 10, is basically going to say, at its core, eating meat sacrificed to idols isn't an issue. But there's another issue to consider, and that's what we're going to see today. Matter of fact, they're dealing with what was taught by the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, when Paul already challenged them on the topic of circumcision, and then what's now being, uh, and what they came back was that Gentiles didn't have to be circumcised, but told them don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. This is kind of some of the things as they moved out of the Jewish law into the grace that is found in Jesus Christ and the freedom from the law that's there, they struggled with this kind of the theological implications that were, uh, that were going on in, at this particular time, and Paul is trying to ground them in these particular truths. But you had people that had reached this kind of knowledge. And what it says here is that knowledge puffs up. Knowledge is very inward focused, focused on our successes, how smart we are, the information that we have, uh, we have been able to have been taught and the information that we have learned. But he says, on the other hand, love builds up. He's not pitting and saying you love and don't have knowledge. We know there's plenty of places in Scripture. We've even seen that in 1 Peter, where we are encouraged to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That these things are called to where we grow in knowledge, but knowledge and love have to work together. If they don't work together, what you have is not, something that simply brings about pride in the heart of the one that has knowledge and destroys the one that hasn't reached that particular knowledge that's there. Matter of fact, he goes on to say, even in verse 2, he says, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he said he doesn't yet know it as he ought. There are a lot of things that we can learn, and there are a lot of things that we can grow in. But the, matter, the, the truth of the matter is this, none of us have arrived. None of us have arrived. All of us are still in the journey of growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. None of us have arrived at a perfect knowledge of all of the things of God. And quite honestly, this side of heaven, we won't. We will grow in our sanctification. We will grow in our knowledge of truth, but we will never understand things perfectly this side of heaven. And so we always should be in a position where even though we might be learned, and we might know things, always tempered by the fact of knowing I might not know everything perfectly. So that knowledge doesn't puff up, but yet we have this attitude of love that we are to show towards one another. This is grounded in a truth when he gets to verse 3 that's here, which really kind of lines up with the first and greatest commandment that Christ gave us. This idea of loving God is the first and greatest commandment. Loving God with all of our heart and our mind and our soul. And likewise, it tells us here that those that are love God, and so keep in mind this entire picture of the church in Corinth, people that are divided over different topics, that love God, they have a desire to love God, coming from different backgrounds. And the greatest truth that comes from that from a knowledge perspective is this, is that God knows all of them. They are all his children. Some are not lesser children. Some are not greater children. They are all his children in the body of Christ. And this is one of the things that we know is that we can only love God because he has known us. He has called us into his kingdom and he has redeemed us. That's a great place to kind of change your perspective on how it is that you look at things and look at others within the body of Christ. Open door. You know, there was a time in my life before I was in the current position that, I, that I'm in at, the, at Southeastern Seminary where I used to sit back and I used to look at decisions and watch decisions that were made. And I, I was like, what, what did they make that decision for? Don't they know X? Don't they know Y? What's wrong with them? And, and I was freely willing to share that opinion with anybody that asked or didn't ask. And I can remember still very, very clearly this moment about two weeks until I moved, after I moved into a form of my current position, where I was sitting in the chair in my office and I went, oh, that's why they made the decision that they made. I thought I had knowledge. I didn't have knowledge. I was nowhere near having knowledge, but I was confident that I did. 
and it was all about me. And I learned about the fact that I'm still growing in knowledge of all the things that I have responsibilities for, and even in my walk with Christ, and even to know the truths that are taught within Scripture. And I have to be in that posture of humility, in that posture of focusing on love towards one another. You know, in our congregation, we have lots of educated people. Matter of fact, this entire Triangle region, we have, if you don't know this, the Triangle region, it's not the highest, but it's one of the highest concentrations of PhDs anywhere in our country, right here in the Triangle. Lots of smart people. Lots of smart people that don't even have PhDs. We have, in our church, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have teachers, we have engineers. And even in this church, we have another kind of dynamic that a lot of churches don't have outside of this particular area, We have lots of people that are associated with a seminary. Lots of people who have spent years studying theological topics. They teach in those settings. They learn in those settings. They work in those settings. And when you put all of those things together, pride is something for this church that we have to be very, very, very careful of. Because we can reach a place where we think we have knowledge. And we've arrived and we stop growing and the knowledge that we're trying to seek out, and we find ourselves in a position where we're more focused on our knowledge than our love for one another, and how it is that those two things fit together. We can sometimes, with this knowledge, one of the ways that it works out in love is that when we are dealing with topics, we speak with a sledgehammer rather than caring for one another like a gentle mother because of the knowledge that we possess. Remember, our goal is to build one another up in Christ. That's our goal. We learn, we have heard many times from Hebrews chapter 10 about the fact that we don't neglect the gathering with one another so that we might spur one another up onto love and good deeds. We know we have spiritual gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. We know we have been given leaders within the church for the purpose of building up the body. We have a goal, and that goal is when we gather to build each other up. So what we've seen in verses 1 through 3 is that we live in this unity through humility by seeking to build one another up in love. Next, in verses 4 through 6, I want us to see that we live in unity by understanding that our faith and practice is centered on foundational truths. Our faith and practice is centered on foundational truths. Verses 4 through 6, Paul says this, about eating food sacrificed to idols, then we know that an idol is nothing in the world. And that there is no God but one, for even, uh, even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, or, in many, or many gods or many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father. All things are from him, and we exist for him, and there is one Lord Jesus Christ. All things are through him, and we exist through him. Paul's returning to the question at hand. He, he first is trying to address the attitude Uh, that that, that they have, this love towards one another. And now he's going to back to answering the question about can you eat meat sacrificed to idols? And what we see, and as as I've already hinted at, is through the implications of this particular passage and what we don't have time to look at in chapter 9 and in chapter 10, is that we do have the freedom to eat meat sacrificed to idols. We do have the freedom to do it because of the implications of these foundational truths that exist, that are here. He says, about about eating food sacrificed to idols, then we know that an idol is nothing in the world. This is what Paul is teaching us. There's all kinds of statues all around this world that represent idols and are worshipped, and they're nothing. They're just stone. They're just wood. Any power that seems to come of them is nothing but Satan's deceptive efforts to think that this idol is actually something. What he says here in this case is that there's an an idol is nothing in this world and there is no God but one. This is true even from the very beginning of Scripture, from the very beginning of time when it was even part of of the Shema, which was the Jewish confession of faith. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, as that starts off saying, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The God that we serve is not one of many gods. He's not somewhere on a hierarchy of gods. He's not even at the top of a hierarchy of gods. He is the only God. 
Everything else is just Satan's deceptive efforts to make you think that there's some other truth that's out there. And the truth is, there is only one God. Matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 44, what we see is this talk among the, or this encouragement, exhortation among the people of Israel from God through the prophet Isaiah when he's talking about idol worship, and he starts off in verse 6 saying this, This is what the Lord, the King of Israel and its Redeemer, the Lord of the army says, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God but me. He goes on in that passage to talk about the ridiculousness of idol worship. He says, you know, what happens? You go and you grow a tree, and then with your own hands, you cut down the tree, and then you cut it up, and you use it to make fire, to cook your food, and to warm yourself. And then when you're all done, you take and you carve a little image, and you bow down and worship to it. He says, do you see that idols are nothing? Now, he does concede that from a human perspective and from a worldly perspective, there are things that are called idols, called gods, called lords. He goes on to say in verse 5, for even if they are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. He's not saying they are gods and they are lords. He's speaking from a human perspective as to how it is that they are referenced. But this is this truth that he brings to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, that yet for us, there is one God, the Father. And here's what he tells us about this truth. All things are from him. The meat is available to us to eat. The things that are available for us to drink. All things are from him and exist for him. It's all focused on worship of God and no one else. And likewise, he goes on to expand this foundational truth of saying that there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, and likewise, all things are through him and we exist through him. Our identity as believers in Christ is not our past. It's not the things that we've experienced. It is who we are in Jesus Christ. This is our identity. This is why it is that we can look at the truths of these and on a base theological level, say there's no issue with eating meat sacrificed to idols because there's no such thing as an idol. There's only one God, one Lord, Jesus Christ, and we exist, we exist through him, and all things are through him. These are the foundational truths that we have. As I said, the implication that he's making here is that meat sacrificed to idols is not an issue as he works out at 9 through 10. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 to 24, he says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. No one is to seek his own good, but for the good of the other person. And this is where we're going to start to see a turn in this passage. We go, okay, we have this foundational truth, but we're going to need to think differently about this. You know, foundational truths are things that we interact with all the time. Think about rules of the road. I just came back from driving uh, four and a half hours to Anderson, South Carolina, and back. Spent a lot of time on I-85. And you're reminded on a frequent basis that there are rules of the road. And if these rules of the road are followed, things go smoothly. When they're not, things don't go well. Traffic slows down. You have accidents, all these other kinds of things. Rules like faster traffic on the left. Novel idea. Versus the person that hits, you know, the left lane, they set their crews and they're going below the speed limit, but I've claimed the left lane and I'm not moving. Or people that then freely, because of that, end up passing on the right, which they're not supposed to do, which then causes all other kinds of issues that are there. Foundational truths that we follow when we drive that are supposed to avoid helping or to help avoid create chaos. Well, in the church, we have foundational truths. We have what are called first-order doctrines, things that, quite honestly, if you don't hold to these, you can't be called a Christian. You have to hold to them. Things that we've read about here in this passage, that there is one God, there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, that he is the only way to salvation. There are not multiple ways to salvation because there are no other gods. So he is the only way to salvation. We believe these truths that are here and that God has even communicated us through special revelation, his holy word, 
These truths that are here, the truths of the resurrection, these are first order doctrines, and there's many more, but there's first order doctrines that we hold to that if you don't hold to these things, you're not a Christian. But in our church, as Pastor Dwayne talked about last week, while there is the picture of the universal church, there is also the picture of the local church. And as a matter of fact, most of the references in the New Testament, when it talks about church, is referencing a local church. And in a local church, there's an authority that is given to the local church to determine on, on important issues what it is that that church holds to. For example... I won't, use, I won't go through all kinds of different examples, but I'll use this because something that's unique about Open Door, it's not unique in the sense of there's not any other churches about it, but just as you kind of define churches, is we are a Baptist church. What does that mean? A Baptist church means that we have a very particular view on baptism, that we say this is what Scripture teaches on baptism. This is what we believe from an authoritative standpoint as to how it is that we hold to this concept of baptism. You see, baptism is something that most Christians hold to. They just define it different. They define how it is that it applies to a, to a particular person at a particular time in a particular mode. We believe that baptism, that Scripture teaches that baptism is only for those that have been redeemed. Post-conversion. We believe that baptism is to be done by Immersion. That's why we have a baptismal tool that pool that's back here. And when you see people get baptized, they go all the way under the water and they come back up. That's the sense of immersion. This is why when you go through your membership interviews with a staff member or an elder, we're very particular about asking questions about your salvation and about baptism, what order they occurred in and how they occurred. And so we as a local church our leadership have defined this is what it takes to be one of the issues that takes to be a part of our particular local body. There's more that's there. I encourage you when you have time, if you haven't looked at it in a while, go to our website, go to the About Us section and the What We Believe, and you can see our statement of faith. And these are the things that we say, you hold to these things to be a member of Open Door Church. These are the things that we believe these are the things that we believe that Scripture teaches and are most important on these particular topics that are here. And then beyond that, we have tertiary doctrines, third-level doctrines, things like when is Christ coming back, things like how exactly do deacons serve, things along those lines. And then we have another level that's beyond that, and that's what's called Christian liberty. That's particularly what's at, at, at uh, discussion here with 1 Corinthians chapter 8. These are things that we decide based upon what the Bible teaches, but we try to, through biblical wisdom, come up to what these things mean for us. These can be things like the style of music that we like, the education that we approach, our views on social media, our political persuasions. These things do not define our fellowship at Open Door. Listen to me. These things do not define our fellowship at Open Door. One of the hardest things during this pandemic and during this political season is when we have seen brothers and sisters in Christ break fellowship one another over silly, silly issues because they have lost sight of what it means to actually be unified around the most important doctrines and topics that we hold to as a local church and to everything else to hold loosely. We likewise on these particular things have to be careful not to impose these things on one another. Things that we might feel or certain convictions that we have, this is where fundamentalism and legalism comes in. When we state, start to take a decision that we have made as a matter of conscience for us and we begin to impose that on everybody else and say this is the standard of righteousness. That's where we struggle. So we hold to these foundational truths that are here but at the same time, we're heading into a discussion of what do we do with these foundational truths when the implications of them, there seems to be some difference of when it comes to Christian liberty. So we've seen in verses four through six that we live in unity by understanding that our faith and practice is centered on foundational truths. However, what are we to do when these foundational truths might give us permission to do something and not violate our conscience, but others still have an issue as a matter of conscience in a particular area? Verses 7 through 13, we're going to see that we live in unity 
through our willingness to lay down our rights to keep one another from sin. Our willingness to lay down our rights to keep one another from sin. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. However, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat, and we are not better off if we do eat. And we're, but we are careful that this right of yours is no way to become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, dining in the idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? So the weak person, the brother or sister from whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Now when you sin like this against brothers and sisters in Christ and wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. So this is only possible when we're seeking to have all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in this church walk faithfully. We're not just here to simply receive, but we're actually here to interact with one another. To see each other walk faithfully in Christ, to, as Scripture calls us, to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And I think sometimes what we see is, is that how there's this difference of knowledge where people haven't come to the place of fully understanding the truths. And I think this is what's being communicated in verse 7 by Paul is that these, there are some people with meat-eating sacrifice to idols have not yet fully understood the implications of the truths that he just shared in verses 4 through 6. So for them, because of being so ingrained in this past of idol worship, they've had to remove themselves two or three steps so as to not fall into sin. One commentator said it this way, he says, even though they no longer worshipped and served idols, they were not yet released from the influence of their own past. The believers who were strong said that idols were nothing but wood and stone. Yet every time the weak Christian came in contact with something that related to an idol, they were confronted with a conflict. They were like a former addict who fights an inner battle every time he comes in contact with drugs. The struggle that they face. What's important to realize here, the burden of unity, the burden of unity is primarily placed on the more mature believers. The burden of unity is primarily placed on the more mature believers. You might get to a place where sometimes you think, oh, when can we get past this? We're not. And you're willing to lay down your rights for your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Matter of fact, he uses this example. He says in verse 8, he says, food's not going to bring us close to God. You might love a good steak, but you know what? It's not going to bring you any closer to God. And quite honestly, you're going to forget about it in a minute anyways. That's there. And he says, food's not going to bring you any closer to God, and we're not worse off if we don't eat it, and we're not better off if we do. So if you get to a place where you have to give something up, so be it. Because you know what? It's really not doing anything for you. This idea of Christian liberty is just a neutral category that's not bringing you any closer to God, and your main emphasis is, what can I do to bring myself closer to God? He goes on to say, as we look at these things with these, what he calls these rights that are here, he says, be, be careful in verse 9 that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. We have rights, but we're willing to give them up because of our responsibilities to our brothers and sisters in Christ are greater. That's how we look at this local body of Christ. That's how we look at unity. And keep in mind, we can do something You ready for this? You can do something that because of your conscience is not actually sin in itself, but is sin because of the impact that it has on your brothers and sisters in Christ. Talk about blowing your mind. It's not sin itself, but what you lead your brother and sister in Christ to do because of it actually is sin against them. And as even told us here by Paul, it's not just sin against them, but it's sin against Christ. It's sin against our brothers in Christ whom he has redeemed, and it is sin against Christ himself. Our love is so great that for our brothers and sisters in Christ, we will walk away 
It was something that we greatly enjoyed. Our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ and Open Door Church is so great that we will walk away from even from something that we greatly enjoy for the sake of their faithfulness and their walk before Christ. This greatest act of laying down a right is what Christ did for us on the cross. For a believer, we look at this. We look at this as an example. And we see the extent to which Christ went to lay down his right, his right to the throne room of heaven, to come as a man, to condescend into the form of a man, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross for our behalf because of his love for us, what he was willing to give up. If you are an unbeliever here, if you're not a follower of Christ, you're not sure that you're a follower of Christ, this is the greatest truth that you need to hear right now. The greatest truth is that God came in the form of man. Jesus Christ came in the form of man, died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin because you're an enemy with God. That's how scripture describes anyone with outside of Christ, an enemy with God. But he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, became sin on your behalf. And then likewise, rose from the grave on the third day so that you might have the resurrection. To follow Christ, to accept, to receive what it is that Christ has done for you on the cross is simple. It's just to say to God, to say to Christ, I'm a sinner. I'm outside of you. I can't save myself. And it's only through the power of what you have done on the cross for me and the power of your resurrection that I can have my sins forgiven and I can spend eternity in heaven with you. If that's you today, don't let today go by without addressing that issue. Deal with it now. If you're not sure what that means, if you want to talk about that further, even if you in your heart said that right now, I encourage you as you leave today, find one of the elders, find one of our staff members, find another church member here and say, you know what? I, I think I need to give my life to Christ or maybe I've just given my life to Christ. What does that mean? We want to sit down and we want to talk with you about what it is that that looks like. Meat sacrifice to idols, as I kind of joked at the beginning of the sermon, seems like a foreign discussion to us. It's not something that we deal with in our context. It is dealt with throughout the world in a variety of different contexts, but not here in America. But what's important to remember is that idols are not simply things that have been carved from stone or things that have been carved from wood. Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says this, Therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. And he expands on that list in the following verses that are here. You see, idolatry is anything that you put as worship before God. That's what idolatry is. And it doesn't matter whether it's carved out of stone or carved out of wood or if it's just something that's consuming your mind, it represents an idol. It represents something that we are to set aside. What that means for us is that while you don't think that you have brothers and sisters in Christ that are going to struggle with meat sacrifice to idols, they do have other idols that they've dealt with in the past. What does this tell us? This tells us as a body of Christ, we have to know one another. We have to know the struggles that we face, the things that we have come out of, the idols that used to dominate our life, so that we can care for our brothers and sisters in Christ and help protect them from violating their conscience and heading down a road that they shouldn't head down. Sometimes we can take our Christian liberty and we can do things like decide that we're going to argue with our brothers and sisters in Christ dismiss what it is that they hold to, or even make fun of them because of it. For example, some might not be able to fulfill the command to not be drunk with wine without being two or three steps and never partaking of alcohol because of their history with alcohol, because it was their God, it was their idol. And for us to dismiss that and think that, no, you should have victory over that, maybe in maturity at some point in time they could, but right now you care for them 
And you don't lead them down a road that's going to lead them back into sin. Another examples today that might be more apropos are technological sins. You might have struggled greatly with pornography in your past. So you've had to make decisions that you feel like help protect you from certain things. Because other people have Christian liberty, not with pornography, that itself is a sin, but on how they interact with technology. You have to recognize that as you deal with your brothers and sisters in Christ, if they decide and say, you know what, I need to stay away from social media, don't make fun of them for it. Realize that this is what they're needing to do to try to protect themselves from sin. And our goal is to support them and help them. They might have been consumed in our particular culture these days. Gaming is a huge issue. And they might have been consumed with gaming where there's just entire life is focused on this. For you, gaming might mean nothing. It's just a fun time to have on a Saturday afternoon. But for others, this was an idol. And they have to protect themselves from this particular idol that they had. Our rights do not give us the right to sin against Christ and our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what's at hand that's here. And what we have at this church is we have what we call a church covenant. A church covenant is a document that we have that's in addition to our statement of faith that talks about how we live together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, you might have had an opportunity as you came came in to pick up a copy of the church covenant. If you did, you can read it from there. If not, it is going to be on our screen. But as we prepare to close today, what I want us to do is I want us to read this church covenant together to remind ourselves what does this mean for us to be this local body of Christ that we call Open Door Church. So if you would, as I read, read aloud with me. In affirming our purpose, mission, and statement of faith, We pledge to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to respond to the gracious provision of salvation in Jesus Christ with obedience, faith, hope, and love. Individually and corporately, we will seek first Christ's kingdom and his righteousness rather than pursue our self-interest. We pledge to make every effort to live in a manner worthy of our calling, to be exemplary in our conduct, and to treat one another with love, respect, and forgiveness. We promise to avoid sin, to abstain from sexual immorality, and any practice which brings harm to the body or jeopardizes our faith. We promise to unite in regular worship, biblical preaching and teaching, fellowship, prayer, observance of the ordinances, and where necessary, church discipline. We commit to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember one another in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to show grace in our speech, to be slow to take offense, and to be ready for reconciliation without delay. We promise to conduct our families according to the pattern laid out in Scripture, to honor biblical marriage, and to raise our children in the instruction of the Lord. We promise to seek the salvation of the lost and to be ambassadors for Christ on this earth, to be loving, just, and willing to serve all people. We promise to promote ethnic diversity within the body of Christ. We commit ourselves to willingly submit to the leaders of the church as unto the Lord, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, and the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel to all nations. We, moreover, promise that when we remove our membership from this church, we will, if possible, unite with another like-minded church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant until we are all united in heaven as we eagerly await the return of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for reading with me uh, together with this or us reading this together. I want to encourage you to remember these words, to go back and look at these words that help you understand how it is that we are going to live together, to confess our faith in unity to the world that surround us. As we close today and we look at 1 Corinthians 8, I just want to remind you that we're able to live in this unity through humility by seeking to build one another up in love. We live in, humi- in, hu- in unity by understanding that our faith and practice is centered on foundational truths. And we live in unity through our willingness to lay down our rights to keep another from sin. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your scriptures. 
Thank you for the fact that we have them because left unto ourselves, this is not where we would arrive. Unity would not be our goal. It would be our own agendas, promoting our own knowledge, forgetting how it is to interact with one another in love and build one another up. Lord, we come from many, many different tribes. And Lord, what I pray is that this local church be our primary identification as we follow you, as our identity is found in you. Be the tribe that we say, this is who we are. These are my brothers and sisters in Christ. These are the ones that I love with all of my heart to see them walk faithfully before you. We pray these things in your mighty, wonderful, and gracious name. Amen.